you know, no bacteria to grow after someone's been on IV antibiotics for several days. I, at that point, really thought I was dying. I could feel my body just shutting down. Everything was just shutting down. I spoke to the family again and told them that the infection was spreading and she needed another operation. June is rushed back into surgery, her third operation in two weeks. About 10 centimeters by four to five centimeters of tissue was removed from the lower portion of the left breast. Obviously, it was a necessity and it's something that can be fixed down the road. My biggest thing was I just wanted her to be healthy and come home whether she had one boob or three boobs. Just a few hours after surgery, Dr. Rizak spots something so startling, she begins to reconsider her original diagnosis. I noticed the necrosis on the IV site and the right arm. It was rare to see two separate sites of infection on two different sides of the body. That was the moment I realized that this was something else. With June going downhill by the hour, Dr. Rizak immediately calls in Dr. Clarissa Yang, a dermatologist at the hospital. I was surprised at how large the ulcer was. Because she had just come out of the operating room, the borders of her wound were quite fresh. But if you looked on her arm and her upper chest, there was this purplish hue that started to form around the ulcer, which was suggestive of dying tissue. What was so unusual was that all her cultures were negative. She had basically lost all of the upper layers of the skin. I was worried that it wasn't an infection, which was what was presumed in her case. Based on what I saw, we suspected that she had another very rare skin condition. But the only way to confirm her hunch is to administer a heavy dose of steroids. And if they bring down the acute inflammation, Dr. Yang will know exactly what she's dealing with. But the treatment is a gamble. If this was actually a rare infection, giving steroids to June would have worsened her infection and she could potentially continue to deteriorate and potentially succumb to her disease. Risky as the treatment is, all Kirk can do is take the chance and pray that the steroids will work. I'm sitting in the hospital and she's fighting for her life. I cried and cried and cried, and it was just killing me. Not knowing if I was even going to have a wife to go down and see the next day. Only eight hours after starting the treatment, June begins to slowly show definite signs of improvement. The borders of her ulcers were getting better. There was no purplish hue, her fever, her white blood count. They all were trending in the right direction. It was the first thing in three weeks that had made it a big impact. I, I was ecstatic that what they were doing was helping. I didn't feel like my body was dying anymore. The fact that she was getting better on steroids confirmed her diagnosis. June was diagnosed with pyoderma gangrenosum. Pyoderma gangrenosum is a rare immune disorder that destroys skin and tissue. In a healthy individual, when the body suffers a trauma, white blood cells are dispatched to heal the damaged area. But in patients with pyoderma gangrenosum, too many white blood cells are unleashed, flooding the injured site and ravaging healthy tissue. We don't understand why patients with pyoderma gangrenosum have this overactive immune response. There is so much of an immune response that comes into the wound bed, it overwhelms the wound bed and actually causes the tissue to die off instead of heal itself. We're not exactly sure of the exact mechanism of why that tissue dies off. That might be too many cells. We have no idea. When I finally got the diagnosis, I was so relieved that finally someone had figured out what it was and given me some answers. While she can't know for sure why the disease set in when it did, 
Dr. Yang suspects the disease was triggered by the very first invasive procedure June had four weeks ago. June went in for a breast biopsy and she developed redness and an abscess formation. Because she has pyoderma gangrenosa, her white blood cells have come to the area and overwhelmed the area to cause tissue death. Trauma of her skin seems to act as a magnet to these white blood cells. And the procedure to remove the titanium chip from her breast was the next step in the vicious cycle of surgery that perpetuated the condition. Anytime you traumatize the skin, the disease process gets much worse. I think that we're causing more damage than good because every time the tissue was cut away, that was trauma to the skin. I don't think it really sank in until I saw the wound open for myself to realize how far this had spread. It was hard. It was hard. I just couldn't believe that I had gone in for a breast biopsy and it had turned into this. It was scary. If there was never a surgery done on the wound, it may have just been an abscess that would have healed or became an ulcer that was still small and relatively manageable. While June is overwhelmed by the horrific turn of events, she's fortunate to have received her diagnosis when she did. If the patient is not properly diagnosed, they can die from the disease because they continue to get repeated surgeries, their wound gets larger, and blood pressure falls, her organs could have completely failed on her. The harsh truth is undeniable. But more than anything, June now just wants to know how to stop the disease that has been wreaking havoc on her body. I went into the hospital and I had a little hole in my chest and I woke up three and a half weeks later and was missing three quarters of my left breast. At that point, I just wanted someone to tell me that they could fix it. After enduring three unnecessary surgeries in which doctors removed most of her left breast, June Pesci is finally on the road to recovery. The steroid treatment Dr. Clarissa Yang began administering eight hours ago is working so well, she's going to continue the therapy to treat the rare skin disorder June is suffering from, pyoderma gangrenosum. Once you initiate steroids, you're decreasing the total number of immune cells to a more reasonable level. And then those cells are now able to help the wound heal. She responded extremely quickly and her wound started closing. Amazingly, after just three weeks of treatment, June is well enough to go home. But emotionally, she's finding it hard to come to terms with how much of her breast she's lost. It doesn't look like me. They're, it's terrible. She was definitely depressed about what had happened. While reconstructive surgery is an option, there's a downside. Even if June is on medication, the invasive procedure could trigger her disease again. We don't know whether her pyoderma gangrenosum would recur or whether she would heal normally. And she has to live with the fear that this may also happen to her again in the future if she had any type of trauma or injury. She can get a paper cut and she could develop an ulcer. As grateful as she is to have survived the gruesome ordeal, June can't help but wonder why it took so long to get a solid diagnosis. The prevalence of pyoderma gangrenosum is not well known, but it's thought to be around 1 in 100 to 300,000. Thank God I ended up going to the one hospital with the one surgeon who knew someone that knew about this disease. I had never seen pyoderma gangrenosum before. Her specific case was unusual because she presented uh, in an atypical manner. Fever is rare in pyoderma gangrenosum patients. The white blood cell count elevation in the blood itself is also rare. Pyoderma gangrenosum is typically thought of as a disease that occurs on the lower extremities. So her case being on the chest was unusual. 
Today, June is living a full and happy life. While she's still healing, her mind is on the future. As far as my health goes, I feel good. I'm ecstatic that I have my wife back. I said, we'll get through it and you know, we'll, we'll deal with it after. As long as you're home, I'm, I'm very happy. Every day is special. My husband and I spend as much time together as we can. Today, she is definitely at terms with what happened and knows that down the road, yes, eventually we'll be back to normal. Are you a good boy, Ryan? <laughs> I've never really questioned anything that's happened to me. I always think that something happens to us for a reason. And maybe this happened to me because I was strong enough to get through it. And I can let other people know about it. While June Pesci had been seemingly healthy her entire life, Brianna Heading's life was at risk within just days of her birth. In the fall of 2005, 22-year-old Katie Rogers was working as a waitress in Wichita, Kansas, when she met her husband-to-be. 20-year-old David Heddings, a Marine sergeant on leave from his first tour in Iraq, walked into Katie's restaurant, and her life was changed forever. I saw him and told the hostess to sit him in my section and <laughs> was flirting with him. We only had two weeks before I had to go back, so we spent every extra moment we had together. I knew the first moment I met him, there was something about him that was different. It just really clicked. Like, yeah, I love this woman. Just three months later, they got married at the local courthouse. Everyone was not wanting us to do it because it was really quick, but we were ready to get married. We loved each other. After we got married, he went back and forth from Iraq, so I was by myself a lot. It was very difficult. Finally, almost two years after they first met, David completes his tour of duty. Soon after he returns home, the couple receives some thrilling news. I found out I was pregnant December 7th of 2007. I was really excited that she was pregnant, and I was also really nervous about being a first-time parent. As they begin preparing for the baby, Katie and David settle down in Wichita. She soon finds work at a local hair salon, and he lands a job in the aircraft industry. My grandpa let us rent one of his houses that we had and got it all fixed back up, and we moved in. Nine months later, on August 12, 2008, the proud young parents welcomed their daughter, Brianna Page Headings, into the world. She looked just like me. It was just the most wonderful experience that I have ever had. I was happy, I was excited. It was a really overwhelming feeling to hold her for the first time. It was the first time I ever held a baby. Brianna weighs in at a healthy eight pounds and 12 ounces. David and Katie are overjoyed. But almost as soon as they take their newborn home, something doesn't seem right. Feeding her was very difficult. She always seemed to eat maybe an ounce and a half, and then within five minutes, she would just throw up everywhere. You'd need a bath towel. You couldn't use a burp rag. It was a huge mess. It looked like you turned a faucet on, and it just kept coming and kept coming. It basically just looked like white milk coming back up. It smelled like raw eggs. she puked all over us. she threw up all over the furniture. That's all we did all day was just clean up vomit. We had no idea what was going on. We were really scared when she was sleeping that she'd throw up on choke on it. Everyone told me baby sped up, but to me this was throwing up. The vomit was projectile. It would shoot out so hard and so much. I called her the exorcist baby. I was worried that she wasn't gaining weight and keeping all the vitamins that she needed from the milk down. Her behavior didn't seem normal, so we took her to see a doctor. After performing a thorough exam, the pediatrician assures Katie that there's nothing wrong with their two-week-old's weight. She's simply suffering from acid reflux, a common disorder in infants. Babies with acid reflux regurgitate their stomach contents because their digestive systems are immature. The doctor said it was normal for Bree to have acid reflux and it would cause her to throw up every time she ate. He said her stomach might just be sensitive and suggested switching to a new formula. We tried a few different formulas. Nothing changed. 